Um, there's one thing uh, in common uh, between today the, the preacher and the, and the congregation, and that is that uh, historically nobody likes the topic. Um, uh, parishioners don't like to listen to it. Preachers don't like to preach on it. Uh, and that's because we're going to deal with uh, the issue of money a little bit. And, uh, and they always uh, dislike that. Uh, not everybody, of course, um, but uh, that's kind of a, a nationwide pattern. Uh, nobody looks forward to it uh, when it's a message on, on money. But we're going to begin by going back to the book of Acts, uh, where we were a couple of weeks back, a couple of weeks before, a week before that. Uh, Acts chapter 2. Because we also have some review today. Acts chapter 2, beginning with the 42nd verse. This is not working again. Uh, I'm suspecting that it's a battery issue because it worked my test kit this morning from back there. Can you give me one tap? All right, well, there's our passage. Uh, Acts 42, or Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So that, again, as I pointed out a couple weeks ago, uh, was the summary of life in the early church. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they, they were together all the time. They, uh, they held things in common. They, they gave so generously that they found themselves selling properties and then taking the money and, and giving it so that they could meet the needs that were arising. Um, and so uh, we draw heavily on that passage, those list of the things that they did, uh, devoting themselves to the teaching and the fellowship, breaking of bread to prayer. Uh, we, as we think about uh, uh, Kenosha Family Church and how we organize ourselves, uh, we draw heavily on that. And it all begins, um, or what motivates that, is, is kind of our slogans. We say that it's our desire to be Christ-like disciples. And we say that it's our mission to make Christ-like disciples. Uh, so it's not good enough uh, that, uh, that we just strive to be a Christ-like disciple because uh, almost a circle logic built into being a Christ-like disciple is the call to make others Christ-like disciples. Um, how many of you knew that was... Uh, that was a rare thing in the world of religion. Did you know that? Uh, the vast majority of religions just aren't very evangelistic. The vast majority of religions, uh, you are or you aren't, and, and they care about who is, and they really aren't all that motivated to try to make other people uh, into them. Um, you, know, the, you know, Jews, uh, if you go back and read the Old Testament law, and, and read the way that God treated the Old Testament Jews and all of that, there's no mandate the Jews are not told to go out and try to turn people into Jews. Uh, that was never part of the mandate. There were some rules eventually made about, uh, about what to do if somebody wants to become a Jew, uh, how you can take them in and, and make them part of your nation. Um, but it, they, weren't, they weren't ordered to do that. It wasn't part of their, their, their job. And, uh, you know, if you study Buddhism, and the, they're all the same. They're not mandated. They're not told to go out and try to make more of you. Uh, that's maybe not entirely unique, but that's mostly unique to Christianity. Uh, it includes the mandate. It's built in 
to try to spread the gospel and bring other people into the kingdom. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why the world gets angry with us, um, especially nowadays. Nowadays, more than, more than any time in the past, I think, they have this live and let live mindset. Fine, you, know, you want to be a Christian, go ahead, but leave us alone. Just let us do our thing, and you do your thing, and that's fine. Well, it's like, my thing includes trying to get you to do my thing. Uh, because I'm mandated to do that. I, I'm supposed to be making Christians. So anyways, uh, we want to make disciples. And, uh, and, and again, that comes from, or, or tied to, uh, Matthew 22, 34 to 40, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he gives it. And then, and then we summarize that um, by saying, love God and love others. That's kind of the summary of Jesus' answer to the question, what's the greatest commandment? Or what are the greatest, and he said, and the second is like it, loving one another. So then we identified five ways that we express our love for God and others. So in other words, if you love God and you love others, there are some things about your life that will, that will happen. And, uh, and we've come up with a list of those things. There are five. Uh, and that list is a deepening relationship with God, spiritual friendships, and servanthood. And those are underlined in the word previously is there because two weeks ago and three weeks ago, we talked about those first three. Or two weeks ago and one week ago. No, it was two and three. Uh, we skipped Mother's Day is the thing. Uh, but we're going to come back to that. So those are what we talked about previously. And I want to review those very briefly. Uh, first was the idea of a deepening relationship with God. Uh, with that, we simply say that Christ-like disciples practice intimate worship, both private and corporate, uh, Bible reading and study, as well as other spiritual resources, prayer, and obedience to his leading, following him in the faith. So, you know, you can't just learn stuff about him. Uh, if you learn stuff about him, it's going to say something to us and how we ought to live, and it should change us, and we should live accordingly. So... That's a deepening relationship with God. And then we said that uh, we practice spiritual friendships. Uh, Christ-like disciples understand that friends with Jesus should be friends with each other. Uh, that just makes sense. They frequently get together individually and in groups. Uh, and by individually, we mean like one-on-one. -on -one. Not, not, you don't get together alone. Uh, individually, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and with groups for encouragement, support, loving accountability, teamwork and mission, and even fun. Uh, so that's what we mean by spiritual friendships. The people in the church uh, ought to be friends with each other, and it ought to show. Uh, and then last time, uh, before Mother's Day, we covered servanthood, uh, where we talked about the idea that Christ-like disciples follow Jesus' example and look for ways to serve those around them. Uh, so Jesus told us that he came to serve and not to be served, and, and we had all those examples we talked about. So let's move on then. If you love God and love others, uh, it's going to show up in these five ways, and today's topic is generosity. Um, it is one of our core values. We believe that Christ-like disciples uh, uh, understand that all they have is actually God's, and that they are but stewards, which is a word kind of that means manager. Uh, we are the ones who are to take care of. So everything belongs to God, and we are assigned the task of taking care of his things. Um, and so the passage I read uh, uh, concerning David and the building of the temple, uh, what had actually happened there is David had, had begun gathering the supplies, uh, and then God told him, no, I want your son to be the builder, or to oversee the building, uh, but you know you go ahead and prepare. So David had gotten everything they needed to build the temple and had gathered it, uh, and, it and, and we're talking you know gold and everything. Um, and the people had it had come from the people from donations, um, and so that's where that passage came from. So Christ-like disciples understand that all they have is actually God's, and that they are but stewards. In gratitude, disciples wisely invest all their resources in God-pleasing, God-honoring ways, including but not limited to money, food, housing, relationships, influence, skill, and time. Uh, so they invest all of their resources in God-pleasing ways. 
Well, here's the good news. Uh, it is pleasing to God that you have a place to keep warm and, and food to eat. And so, you know, you should spend money on buying groceries for your family and providing housing for your family and so on and so forth. Um, so when we talk about using our money in God-pleasing ways, that doesn't mean you give everything away. Um, that would not be good stewardship. You know, you, you, uh, that, that wouldn't sustain things very long if everybody just gave everything away. And, <laughs> Uh, that just wouldn't work, but but you ought to be well ready to give when the time comes to give, and you ought to give. So we're going to look at uh, the idea of generosity uh, more in depth today, and we're going to begin by uh, looking at a passage that you wouldn't expect here from John chapter 13. This is actually from the context of the uh, of the, the Last Supper. And something happened during the Last Supper that we don't normally spend uh, time talking about or paying attention to, but if you, if you look at it, you'll notice what happened there. Uh, John chapter 13, beginning with verse 21. The Supper's already been going on. Jesus has already been teaching. Verse 21, after this, he said this. Or after he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Uh, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Uh, leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one whom I will give this piece of bread, which I have dipped uh, in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simeon Iscariot. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus had said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some, of, uh, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy that which was needed for the festival, or to give something to the poor. And I want to end it there, uh, instead of reading the next verse, uh, outside of the context. Um, what that kind of shows, because they thought that maybe Judas was, was supposed to go buy some supplies, or was supposed to do this because he was the keeper of the money, he was the treasurer, uh, it turns out that pooling their resources and using them to do God's work was apparently normal operating procedure. Apparently they had established this pattern that uh, they were going to have someone who would, who would gather the money and, and hang on to it and then spend it accordingly. Uh, doesn't that sound a little bit like the way the church operates today? Um, you know, poor Dave Groshek, uh, not only was he elected to the board today, uh, I'm not really a prophet, but I can tell you that the next time the, the board meets, we will elect new officers for the year. And guess who we're going to elect to be our treasurer again? Dave Groshek. Uh, he, what's that? Seven. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that pattern was apparently going on as far back as Jesus and the disciples. They had this group of 12 that spent all this time together, and they traveled together, and they did things. And, and apparently, they pooled their money, and the treasurer uh, dispensed it as he was supposed to. And, and we learn in other places that Judas wasn't a very good treasurer. He was apparently from time to time pilfering from the funds uh, and, and doing some of that. But, uh, but the idea was there that they were uh, pooling their money together to do the ministry and using a, a joint treasurer to take care of everything. Um, and so that idea of, of working and living off the, and we're also told that it was uh, some, of the, uh, some of the rich women uh, we're providing a lot of those finances. They were the ones supporting the disciples as they traveled around and did this stuff. So where did it all begin? Um, the truth is, it really begins all the way back in the book of Genesis. So let's go to Genesis chapter 4.
And we're going to go to verse 1 of chapter 4. Genesis 4, 1. Okay. Adam made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Okay, so they were both farmers, just different kinds of farmers. Uh, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, that portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Um, now I'm going to stop there. I actually read beyond where I was planning to stop. Um, but I want you to notice some things about this first offering. Uh, first of all, there was no recorded precedent. Um, we don't read about Adam and Eve preparing an offering and presenting it to the Lord. Uh, we don't read about the Lord telling Adam and Eve to prepare an offering and bring it to him. Uh, we don't read about God telling uh, him. So, so there was no recorded precedent and there was no recorded command. Uh, at this point in time, uh, an offering had not yet been commanded. And evidently, uh, giving this offering to God was spontaneous and natural. They hadn't been told to do it. They hadn't been commanded to do it. Uh, he just up and did it. And his brother then went up and did it too. Now, it is true that this evolved. Uh, we often refer to the Bible as being an unfolding uh, revelation. God begins to teach his people things in, a, in an ever unfolding way. Uh, he gets more detailed and he, and he explains more things. You know, in the, in the early days, he begins to teach them that he is their God. They're not supposed to worship these other gods. And then later, he teaches them, in fact, <laughs> those other guys aren't even real. I'm the only God. But, you know, that, that, he didn't tell them that all at once. He told them that, it revealed it to them little by little. And the same was true with the idea of the offering. Um, it began, Cain and Abel uh, gave to, uh, to God without being told to. For somehow they, they wanted to do that. Uh, it, it, it was just, you know, kind of a self thing. Um, by the time the Old Testament came to an end, um, things had changed a lot. In fact, we're going to read uh, a passage from the book of Malachi, the last book of the New Testament, in the Old Testament. So uh, turn to Matthew and make a left turn. Uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. So the way my Bible is arranged, this is like on the last two pages of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. Verses 8 to 12. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. Um, and by the way, you know, years and years ago, um, we had a lawnmower that we kept here on the lot before the building was here. And someone came and stole it one night. And some of the people that, that lived around, some of the people that I knew and we talked and stuff, they was, man, I can't believe somebody would rob from the church. And they were just dumbfounded by that. And part of me was like, no kidding. <laughs> if I were going to rob someone, that's not who it would be. Uh, but, but, you know, that, that's what they did. Um, 
God is the one speaking. <laughs> Will a mere mortal rob from God? Yet you rob me. But they asked, how are we robbing you? And he answered, in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. That's not something you hear him say very often. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room in the store, room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and your vines and your fields will not drop their fruits before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So the first offering they gave spontaneously without having been ordered to or told to. And by the end of the Old Testament, it has evolved to the point where they've been commanded to give in these circumstances and give that amount and this, that, and the other, to the point where God says, to the extent that you don't give, you're robbing me. That's quite the change from them just giving spontaneously in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, but that's the way the story went. Let's return to Cain and Abel. We're going to read uh, the next few verses where we stopped, Genesis chapter 4. This time we're going to start where we left off in the middle of verse 4 is where I intended to leave off. Uh, and Abel also brought an offering. That's why I plan to stop. Fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Favor. So Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Uh, so that's the second part of the Cain and Abel story, which presents a little bit of a mystery. The question comes up uh, about why the one offering was accepted and the other rejected. And initially, we think, well, based on the way the story is told, it must be uh, the nature of the offering. Uh, but we find that there was more to it than that. So we're going to go to the book of 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but 1 John. Uh, chapter 3. using one of our worship Bibles all the way to page 987. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So we find out that it was, uh, it was Cain's actions that was the evil, not the uh, content of the offering. Uh, bottom line, uh, Cain murdered Abel because he was jealous. Uh, it was apparently uh, Abel's idea. I'm going to give an offering, and then Cain said, well, I'm going to give an offering. And, uh, and he was jealous because Abel's offering was accepted and his wasn't. So what was wrong with it? Was it that God didn't like grain? Well, later we, we find all kinds of verses. There are some clues. Um, well, first of all, God told him that if, that if he did right, it would be accepted. And other scriptures make it clear uh, that it wasn't the content of the offering. There are places where we are told 
uh, to bring an offering of grain or to bring, a, you know, those kinds of things. And so that wasn't it. Um, it says his actions were evil before the murder. You know, the murder was, of course, really evil. But, but he said his, his, his offering wasn't accepted because his actions were evil. Um, I think we get a big clue from the great poet T.S. Eliot uh, where it says this, The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Let that sink in. The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. Um, apparently, this was Cain's problem. Uh, he gave his offering, but apparently not for the right reason. So how was it given? Well, we can ask some questions. Was it given reluctantly or begrudgingly? You know, it's one thing when the offering is being taken, and it's like, uh, oh, you know, the Lord bless me this week, I'm going to give my tenth, you know, and it, uh, and then there's the, oh man, it's time for the offering again. I've got to give something. Uh, and besides, you know, needing to give, I, I need to make sure that people see me give this. Uh, I need to show up a little. Uh, there are those who do it that way, uh, like to make a big deal out of their offerings. Or maybe it's given uh, to manipulate God. I've seen that before too. Um, they, they think, you know, if, if I give a bigger offering, then the Lord's going to bless me more. Uh, and the Lord has said that he would, you know, so that's not entirely not true, until it becomes the motive. Uh, when it becomes the motive, uh, um, you know, if I do this, then God's going to have to be nice to me. God's going to have to do this for me. And, and you know, if I do a better job of tithing, uh, maybe I'll double tithe and the Lord will heal my cancer, you know. Uh, you get into that mindset. You're trying to give to manipulate God. Maybe it's a combination of all of those. Uh, you want to show up a little bit. Uh, you just feel that pressure that you have to or else. And, you know, if I do this, God will have to do that. And you put all those things together. Um, and apparently that's why uh, Cain gave his offering. As opposed to generosity. Uh, it wasn't given just because he was generous. That spirit that says, I want to give back to God, uh, what's his anyway? Uh, so here at Kenosha Family Church, generosity is one of our core values. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, Christ-like servants are going to be generous. Uh, they're going to want to give for the right reason. So, uh, so we want our people to give generously. When it's time to take the offering, uh, we hope that our people will be generous givers. That is, they will give voluntarily and with joy in giving. Uh, and that they will give, you know, the right amounts. Um, including, uh, I've been talking about our church. It's not just our church. Uh, it's generosity in other places as well. Like, where else do you give? In, I'm talking both formally and informally. Uh, you might give to other organizations. Um, but you might also give... Uh, you know, to the guy that you work with that forgot his change today and needs money for the vending machine. And, uh, I'll pay you back Thursdays. You don't even pay me back. Um, I knew a guy once who, uh, it, it kind of convicted me a little. Um, he had a mindset that uh, something would come up and he would decide that he didn't need something anymore that he owned. And, and I thought in my context, my first instinct is to say, I can sell that. And he, and he always said, you know, I can give that to someone. Uh, and that, that mindset just troubled me a little bit. Um, and then partly I talked to some people and, and I taught courses on it. Um, the idea of spiritual gifts, one of those is the gift of giving. We are all called to give. For some people it's a gift. And I think that he was one of those who was a gifted giver. Uh, the, just the very idea of giving came to him more often than it did me. Uh, and I think that's part of that gift of giving. Um, <clears throat> um, I also want to point out that, uh, that we want to give generously from our treasury. So we hope that, uh, that when you, you all give offerings and it comes into the church, 
that when the church board takes that and, and budgets it out, that, that we're also generous with what we do with the money. We're not selfish with it and don't just try to, um, you know, let's just make our place nicer and nicer. You know, every time we get a penny, let's put a penny into beautifying our building. Kind of. um, you know, we believe in a building and I'm going to pass out something pretty soon that talks about it. Um, but we want to make sure that, that we do so correctly. So, uh, one of the things I'm trying to stress today is that your checkbook can be in the right place and your uh, heart not be in the right place. Uh, that, that can happen. Um, checkbook in the right place, your heart in the wrong place. And so that becomes the most important part. So even if you're writing your tithe checks, if you don't have the spirit of generosity as you do it, then God sees it differently. Um, so I encourage you to audit your checkbook. Uh, look through it and see if the money is being spent the way it ought to be in God-pleasing, God-honoring ways. And again, that doesn't mean you're just giving every penny away. Uh, but it means that when you spend stuff, you're spending stuff in a, in a way that pleases God, that he's happy about. Um, but truthfully, we want you to cross off the, the checkbook, and more importantly, to audit your heart. Uh, is your heart in the right place when you give? Uh, whether it be to the church or to something else, uh, is your heart in the right place? Well, I need a couple of volunteers. I have a handout. Two volunteers to hand out our handouts. Come on, Dan. That's <laughs> two old men will do it. All right. <laughs> Dan, you give those to those on your side. Mm -hmm. yes. take one. On your side. Uh, this is our, it's called the projected missional budget. So this isn't the standard line item budget where everything is itemized down to the line, uh, but rather this is a kind of a conglomeration of those using broad categories. Uh, and this is based on the numbers that our church board uh, put together uh, just a couple weeks ago as we prepare for the new year that begins June 1st. Uh, so this is how we want to spend our money uh, if, we, if this is the money that we raise. Uh, it's slightly higher than last year. We think we can raise more this year than last year. Uh, but they're in the categories of, of having a facility, having a pastor, the ministries and programs that we run, and then the money that we give outside of the church. Um, although this doesn't really include, or, or the, uh, the third category includes the money that we give away here in town, like we give to CareNet. Uh, that's in category three. Um, category four is what we give to the denomination primarily uh, to pay for our district superintendent, to pay for our missionaries, so on and so forth. Uh, so we hope that, that you'll look at this and say that Kenosha Family Church is being a good steward of the money that God has entrusted to Kenosha Family Church. Um, and, uh, and we hope that, uh, that when you kind of look at your own spending, that you'll say that, that uh, God would be pleased with the way you're spending your own money and the money that you're giving as well. Let's pray. Uh, 